Welcome everyone to the Green Effect Podcast. We've got episode 22, Dave Jaworski, Mayor, City of Waterloo. This is the first of a few episodes with both himself and uh, Barry Vervanovic from uh, Kitchener. So with Dave today, we're going to talk about affordable housing, uptown Waterloo and how expensive it's gotten, land transfer tax. Are we going to see that from one of the cities? Student housing, licensing, uh, uh, several hot topics around uh, investors. And without further ado, here we go with Dave. Welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. Finance, life, business, and everything in between. And now, your host, Stephen Green. Welcome everyone to the Green Effect Podcast. Today we've got Dave Jaworski, Mayor for the City of Waterloo. Welcome Dave. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Okay, so let's get started. Now, first of all, I got to bring this up because it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I love that you're here not in a suit, yes. rode your bike here. I love it. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, some days are good to have casual days for the mayor, for everyone, right? But uh, what I found in my job is that if you wear a suit and tie, you can pretty much walk in any, anywhere because people think you, you, you must be in charge, you must know something here. That's right. And so it's very powerful to have a suit on nowadays because nobody wears a suit and tie. But uh, no, certainly when I'm out and about, uh, like on weekends, uh, this past weekend, Barry, Mayor of Kitchener and I were at uh, various events wearing shorts, dressed like uh, everybody else does, having fun with uh, friends and family and kids and uh, really, that's what our community is all about. Well, that makes me feel good because yeah. I have that issue. My boss says I have that issue. <laughs> um, and I dressed up special today. I have pants on, so it's a good day. Oh, you know what I mean? I hate so. to ask what you normally do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. You don't want to know. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about you. Where, where? What has your path been in business, career, oh, sure. before you became the mayor? Well, I think I'm the only mayor in uh, the world that probably has a math computer science degree. So it's something that uh, I came here from a uh, small town, Delhi, Ontario, worked on tobacco farms all my uh, youth and uh, decided when uh, Radio Shack computers came into my school in grade 12 I thought hmm, maybe these things have legs I uh, liked working lurking hard and so applied to the co-op position at our co-op uh, program at the University of Waterloo mm-hmm. and uh, you know came, came here and uh, worked on my work terms in Toronto at IBM mm-hmm. my wife uh, she's local from Grand River uh, Collegiate she went to Waterloo for math uh, we met up uh, Got married age 25, kids age 30, and uh, when we were looking at finding a place after school in 1988, we decided that uh, Waterloo Region, this community, was really the big enough city for us. And we, uh, she worked at one of the first, um, probably the first 10 startups. So now we think of startups, and we know there's hundreds. Yeah. And back then there was uh, Whatcom, uh, founded by Professor Wes Graham of the University of Waterloo. Uh, she uh, started working there. There's only about 40, 50 people there. It's now what's called SAP here in Waterloo. Of course, yeah. And uh, so she's, uh, we've just, you know, had our kids here, raised our families here. And it was through all that working at, uh, eventually working um, uh, at RIM from 2000, 2012. Uh, it's just such a wonderful place, this community. And so when my time came to an end, shall we say, at RIM, I helped out at Capacity Canada, a great not-for-profit. And people said to me, you know what? Um, you've worked in the community relations, philanthropy, environmental responsibility. And when I was at Research in Motion, they said, you know what, you should take a shot at running for mayor. And uh, I actually said to them, I go, you know what, I read the paper. They say bad things about the mayor in the paper. Like, I'm a nice guy. I'll hurt my, hurt my feelings. <laughs> and they right. said, oh, you'll get used to it. And uh, anyway, nonetheless, here Have I Have you am. gotten used to it? Uh, yeah. Or you, you don't have a lot of people yeah. saying bad things about well, you too you, much, eh? You know, I think it's... Uh, you know, it's the, uh, the the twist of the story, right? Sometimes in order to tell a good story, it, it sounds, you know, sounds really good. But, you know, to, to you reading it, who is, who is there, you kind of think more fondly of the situation, right? So you just kind of have to let things roll. That, that would, yeah, and that would be tough. That would be tough. I think you've, you've got a lot of people with opinions. Yeah. And I think a lot of it probably comes from just being passionate about their city. And you have to deal with what they say. Well, right? at the end of the day, and I think I know you have some questions for me on uh, like rental housing and that. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, when we're in council, it's a binary decision: yes or no, right? right? You know, you could say it's not like the Olympics where you're oh, the skater gets an eight out of ten or anything like that. For us, the skater gets a ten or gets a zero. There's no, <laughs> we only raise our hands or uh, for yes or no, and uh, so it's uh, a tough job at the end of the day, but very rewarding because you well. 
everybody here who's listening or watching you just can see what a beautiful community that we've uh, put together of course of course so great segue um about people having opinions and beautiful community yeah uh let's talk about housing so i mean i'm sure you answer this 50 times a day yeah. and i and i think i've got I've got more of the the mortgage side behind me. I right, see first time right. home buyers come through. Obviously, the you know the big bad bank and stuff like that. But yeah. tell me about how you're feeling, what you're seeing around affordability. It's expensive to live here, and it's gotten even more expensive. Yeah. So I would say it's um uh, it's not a uh, affordable housing problem. It's not just a homelessness problem. It's a affordability across the spectrum problem, mm -hmm. ranging from homelessness at, a, at its hardest, most deepest thing where people do not have a home or they're couch surfing, all the way through to first time home buyers and trying to afford that first home, getting that first down payment, when as you know, prices continue to escalate because of the great economy and great community that we have here. Um, and then finally at uh, at the other end where you know, you're a senior, maybe senior alone, and you want to downsize. And you try and find, oh, I want to downsize from my, my Beechwood home, four bedroom, you know, the one that we raised my family uh, in, my spouse is now gone, and I want to downsize. And you go to where? Because of gentrification in Uptown where, you know, these, uh, what used to be a two bedroom home is now either a, uh, has been renovated, has been changed, and those are much more expensive as well. So it's really a concern all the way across the, uh, the continuum that we as uh, elected officials really have to try to find ways to deal with. The challenge really is prosperity and affordability are two sides of the same coin. As soon Good as you point. have prosperity growing, your affordability takes a hit. If you have affordability where prices are coming down, generally it's because your prosperity is taking a hit in the community. And we can all think of communities that have suffered uh, very much so in the past uh, number of years. And we're very fortunate with the, uh, the research and motion downturn in 2012-ish uh, that um, shed 9,000 of 10,000 jobs locally. And to put that in perspective, that's the equivalent of about manual life and sun life uh, employment locally. And, uh, and we came through it, thanks to all the startups, the ecosystems, the investment from different levels of government and creating companies. And so we're creating that. But each one of these we have um, uh, point um, uh, programs for and are trying to work things through. Often at municipal level, we can only do that which uh, a law exists for us to do. People of often course. say, like, you know, somebody's putting up a very large apartment building. Why don't you uh, make it affordable? Well, there's no law. We have no tools to do that. It's the free market, right? So there is... Um, now, what, a, what level of government do you see as being the one that has control over that? Pro province controls what municipalities do. Yeah. So province, as, as people would well know, um, over the past uh, six, seven months, there's been a lot of changes. The provincial government has a lot of power. And so uh, it's really, it's up to the provincial government to either grant us power or to take power away to, uh, to address these issues. And there's really, at this point, very little tools. One other unfortunate thing is that what I call the Robin Hood taxes, mm -hmm. you know, tax from the rich to give to others. Uh, so the Robin Hood taxes, income tax on high salaries goes exclusively to the province and the federal government. Business taxes exclusively to the federal and provincial government. Uh, HST, so consumption taxes. So if somebody buys a fancy new sports car because of all their, you know, their good, uh, good luck in their startup or whatever, uh, zero dollars comes to the local municipality. Everything goes to federal and provincial. So we're kind of stuck there, where you know we can't um, um, take those 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 great Robin Hood taxes and put them to good work for affordable housing because they're not ours. So we have to depend on those coming to us through different programs, which the federal and provincial government are working on. Yeah, and we're going to come back to that because yeah. I, I want to talk about some of the reorganization and stuff yeah. like that because mm -hmm. those are some really really great points. Mm -hmm. um, so you sit on, and I mentioned that's my last podcast, you sit on the Waterloo Region Housing Master Plan Steering Committee. What is that? Yeah, so I actually just started on that one. I haven't been to a first meeting yet. So okay. I, I, I'm a bit of a, uh, uh, I, I can't give you full some details on that. But what I can tell you is that really it's the housing across the spectrum, just as we discussed, is trying to find ways, uh, particularly on the most vulnerable, and how to handle that. A great example is there was, what was, uh, there was a count a number of years ago where people would go out for uh, for a week on successive nights and find out how many people are afflicted by homelessness in throughout Waterloo region and uh, we've done that a couple of times now and the answer is about 300 right so now it's a quantifiable solvable problem we know there's 300 people there's people named Dave there's people named Steve and etc we know what their issues are so once we have a better understanding of their issues some are mental health, not all are mental health but mm -hmm. what are their issues and how can we help them get into a place that uh, gives them gives them housing or even sometimes claiming that which is due to them the uh the money uh through ontario works 
or other programs that is due to them that they don't have bank accounts oh. they can't apply okay, for so we're talking just basic oh. taking people that just they, need they, steering for lack absolutely. of a better term and trying to get okay absolutely so, supports is really the word for it supports and supportive housing very proud of supportive housing of waterloo on herb street mm-hmm. created a second site uh, now known as mike's place we're all very proud of that and tell me more about that well so uh supportive housing of waterloo was started about 10 years ago and um it was kind of funny you roll back the clock and 10 years ago there was lots of concerns that it might be beside a daycare it might be might be this might be that when they went to build their second site just about three years ago through um, the help uh, from the region from the province and also from the city of waterloo some funding that they um there was essentially no complaints so the support of housing for people who are we're helping them get out of a homeless situation and get into a home and then help them through uh people who live there with them mm-hmm. um there was actually no concerns. There was one concern, I think, from a neighboring owner who just said, well, the balconies seem to be facing, like my balconies, that seems a bit of a clash. Could they face the, the street instead, yeah. northwest, sort of east-west, north-south to east-west? And we go, this is great feedback. And it went through, and uh, so now what's known as Mike's Place uh, exists right near the Beachwood Zares and a uh, beautiful home for people. That's great. And that's great that the community is, is open to that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's so a huge So many things win. have changed in the past 10 years that... Uh, I'm blessed being mayor now because we're not we're not really seeing those issues of uh, those kinds of not my backyard people. Affordable housing is on people's minds. Uh, just you lead with it. You're with your podcast. Yeah. It's on people's minds. Yeah, absolutely. Land transfer tax. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I know there's obviously the federal one. Toronto has their beloved land transfer tax. Yep. I know it was an issue a while ago. Is that on the radar? Is that something we're going to see in in the city of Waterloo? Just just for the city yeah. of Waterloo as an yeah. example. No. Um. So I. So let's go back. So uh, back to my Robin Hood taxes. The unfortunate thing is we run the city on really two things, property taxes and user fees. User fees are how much you you pay your kid to go to play hockey or for your water and your sewage bill and that. And that's it. Um, things like uh, we do get the gas tax from the, fe- from the federal government to pay for infrastructure projects. But a great example is um, we get like $3 million a year. But when we did the expansion of uh, Columbia, right by Sobeys to uh, Herbsville Road there, 1.4 kilometers, over $10 million. So that, it was a drop in a bucket in one project, or actually good, a good share of one project. Mm-hmm. So um, all the rest is d- dependent on you and I paying, uh, paying for it. And so that, uh, you know, that becomes uh, a challenge. I forget what the actual question was now. Oh, yeah. uh, land, land transfer, transfer taxes, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I view that as... Um, we like efficient taxes. Like, if you collect a dollar, are you actually able to put 98 cents or 97 cents to work? A land transfer tax, um, it, 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 you'd actually end up processing it. You might end up with 80 cents on the dollar. And what if you're a township, right? You're collecting them. Now you might end up with 60 cents on the dollar. That's not very efficient. We already have these, what I call the Robin Hood taxes that are out there. Um, what about instead of HST being 13% for the federal prevention, federal and provincial government, what about truly harmonizing it, where municipal, federal, and provincial all get a a little share of it, and that would go a long way. And that's an existing tax. It's consumption. Mm -hmm. If you don't consume, if you're, say, a a senior in your your later years, you're not buying new cars, you're not buying uh, golf clubs, you're not buying all these things, you don't pay those taxes. And that's uh, a great way to... uh, to, to get it from people who are buying luxury cars and that and put some money to work. So I think that's a better way. Land transfer tax, um, you know, um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we need more money to fund for infrastructure deficits. People, people know that. Yeah, it's um, a growing community. I mean, know, it's nonstop. If, if right? the province throws it on the table, that would be something. Um, I don't know if municipalities asking for it right now. So I'm part of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And uh, I don't recall that we're even asking for that right now. We're asking okay. for, for increased uh, um, uh, revenue opportunities or even revenue opportunities from the province or the federal government. But land transfer tax, uh, I, I don't view it as on the table. Well, considering what you're going to get on the dollar, too, I guess maybe it just, maybe is there a more effective way Absolutely. to raise that money? Well, right? Use an existing taxation method, right? And I, yeah. I hate using the property tax method because it affects you and I and affordability across the scale. So whether yeah. you're uh, a renter, um, say you have a large family, you're renting a big place, maybe a house, and uh, you're, the price of property taxes go up, so do uh, what you pay. And that's unfair to them because they're, they're simply trying to get by. And so um, other forms of taxes, like I said, the, the other taxes are, uh, are much more reasonable. They, yeah. they impact people who can afford it more so than everybody. Good, good. 
So uh, let me, I'm going to skip ahead. Sure. Uh, so before I did the show uh, with you, you know, I, I reached out to community leaders, um, different people I run into, and I asked them questions. What would you want to ask the mayor? Yeah. Okay. And the one thing that was very consistent, um, especially with investors, yeah. Waterloo, um, student housing, uh, licensing, uh, we can't duplex anything. Mm-hmm. Investors don't want to invest here anymore. Okay. Talk to me about the licensing, where it's going. From what I heard, not firsthand, yeah. uh, the last time it was re- re- reviewed, which I believe was December, um, there was a lot of um, thought that maybe some of the the feelings and the the sentiments around this uh, this program was not listened to real well. And I, again, yeah. secondhand, yeah. not yeah, for firsthand. Sure. So for sure. talk to me more about this. Is it going to keep going? Is it going to change? Tell me more. So um, uh, if we really look back to the, the long story is um, certainly there was a, a death in a basement apartment of a student many, many years ago. And that was sort of the beginning of the process of saying, you know, what, what, can we, what should we be doing as, the, uh, uh, as elected officials in, in Waterloo? And so this was the start of it well, well before my time. And uh, it, it evolved into, um, if, if we roll back 10 years, Um, people would say rental housing properties with absentee landlords when those really came into play. Not the local landlords, not the ones, uh, you know, who might even live there and that. The absentee landlords, the places looked terrible. And uh, so that was actually the main impetus behind it, if we're going back 10 years. And then the the safety behind it, so the furnace checks and that. So what the program was put into place, and it was actually only focused on student housing at the time. and unfortunately, a complaint came to the human rights, uh, uh, whatever, group that said, you know what, it, uh, it can't just be ba- based on a certain demographic. It has to be on all or nothing. And they were hoping for nothing. Unfortunately, it became all. So now that's why you have homes that are rented by people or townhouses that are rented by people who have been there 10 years. Unfortunately, because of that complaint, it spilled over effect onto them. They're not absentee landlords. They're actually living there. They love their homes. They take good care of their, their rented home. Um, but they unfortunately got uh, caught by that as well because of uh, the what your human rights. So um, then, then we move forward. What we've done is what uh, through the program is we've never raised the fee. So it's actually gone down by inflation each and every year. Uh, we continue to, uh, to, to modernize it to make it easier for uh, the landlords to, com- to comply with. Once they've shown a level of compliance, we make some things easier. And uh, also, at the end of the day, if you divide by bedrooms, people often will say it's, it's, it's so much money. You know, I think a renewal is in the area of 300 ish dollars, divided by 12 months, divided by four bedrooms. It's probably about 4 to $7 per bedroom per month, right? Which, um, you know, people are saying impacts affordability. Well, in a lot of cases, um, these places are renting for $550, $600 um, per bedroom per month. So it's really about in the 1% range of, of, of effect. And if we look back to Waterloo, Waterloo uh, Laurier uh, Student Union mm-hmm. and University of Waterloo Federation of Students, um, one of them had one or two staff simply dedicated to landlord complaints and safety complaints um, probably about seven years ago. And both of them put in their uh, letters of support last year when we did the review, the, the five or six year review, and said, you know what, this has been a godsend for students. Um, we get almost no complaints. Um, some of the complaints we're getting is about new builds and, and the large builds, which um, are already governed by the province of Ontario, so we don't govern those. We only govern the, uh, the, the ones that aren't governed by them, so like three stories and under. Mm-hmm. And um, what, uh, you know, the, their I- issues now are more of the new stuff coming on board and is it ready? So we've put in programs in place that as a building is going up, we uh, put a website on in the summer that says, okay, here's your new student hun- uh, student rental housing apartments and here's their current status according to our um, building officials. Okay. So it, it, it's, um, you know, all things being equal, would I want to have it? It would probably become a day where it can be sunset because, as you know, Northdale continues to build out. Northdale being the area north of University of uh, Wolf Laurie University mm-hmm. continues to build out, uh, continues to build higher ones, which are governed by the province, and so you'll see less and less of that. And, uh, you know, um, still, though, you'll see... Uh, garbage in, in the areas of places where absentee landlords or you just drive yeah. down Columbia today and you see grass, grass that hasn't been cut. And so we have to send bylaw people out there and 
you know, uh, if, if, if the fines aren't paying for it, it's you and I who are paying for the absentee landlord who's running a business and not running it to our community standards. That's so true. unfortunately, the, the good landlords, the ones who signed up early, they're the ones who are, you know, doing the right thing. And they're helping out along with uh, you and I through our ta- property taxes to help clean things up seven years later. So the one thing, I we actually had the City of Waterloo come out a couple of years ago now. I did a presentation and we had them out to talk about the bylaw. And uh, it was a room full of real estate agents. Mm-hmm. So you're almost going right to the point of sale, we'll say. Yeah. And the one thing that came through that, that captured my mind was, and I have two kids right now, 16 yeah. and 18, one's off to university. They said, you got to understand, you're dealing with a vulnerable sector. Yeah. It's true. And so that, that resonated with me. So, so I, as a, as a parent, think, great, let's regulate, let's do it. On the flip side, we have a lot of investors that, that aren't real happy. So my question is, where is the disconnect? Because if, yeah. if it isn't expensive, if it does do the right thing, where is this disconnect? Because nobody seems to really have an appreciation for it. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the challenge is people have cho- investors have choices, right? And um, in terms of student housing, you'll see the investors who are making their choices for Waterloo are building very large scale buildings like, you know, approaching hundred million dollar buildings. So those investments are coming coming here. Some of the investments you might be talking about are people who are just buying a house to convert it to a rental to c- get cash flow out of it. Um, you know, I, I guess I have to ask what's the benefit of uh, some of that. What I want is more uh, rental housing stock, particularly on the more affordable end, affordable with the small A, so which is like under $900 as opposed to affordable with capital A, which is about $432 or something like that. Right. So, um, you know, uh, we are seeing the big investments uh, come to town. And as a matter of fact, some might say that's coming too fast because we see these towers go up. Um, but I would say for years and years and years, as we sprawled onto the farmland adjacent to Waterloo, you couldn't see it because it was horizontal in the, uh, in the, in the distance. Now when a building goes up, it's straight up. It's vertical. Everybody notices and everybody goes, do we need another one of those? When reality is, it's only home for 400 people. Mm-hmm. Beachwood and that, they're home. Westvale, they're homes for thousands of people. So, well, well these high-rise yeah. student rentals, though. Uh, so what is the, the 10, 15, 20-year plan if A, uh, you know, um, uh, the number of kids that are going to the yeah. school go down or, or B, kids find other ways to live like a lot of those are very purpose-built you can't move a single family into some of those yeah. so yeah. what's the plan the thought about these purpose-built ta- like student yeah. row tower yeah right so uh, what we did uh, before my time is um, uh, everybody who was building the tall ones found fell in love with uh, what were called five bedroom units mm-hmm. and the reason for that is because you rent it by the bedroom so say six hundred dollars per bedroom five bedrooms with a common area that's three thousand dollars for that apartment That is good money. money. And uh, we said, again, before my time, that that's, you know, those aren't, those aren't ideal. They're also not ideal because the kids live in their single room. They don't really come out to the common area and there's no other common areas elsewhere. So what we've done, uh, what we've done is incented uh, one and two bedroom units. And so you'll see a lot of these areas now are one and two bedroom units. Uh, some of these the, are the new ones coming up. The, the new assuming. ones have been built since about, since before my time. So about 2013, 2012. Okay. Um, so they are uh, certainly uh, usable by anyone. They're actually very nice inside. And uh, uh, some, some of the uh, landlords have even told me that they're, uh, they're at about 30% non-student renters. And this is in the Northdale neighborhood. Now, I've taken it for what it's worth, but um, the reality is, you know, your concerns that you just highlighted are my concerns as well. Demographics, uh, remote studying, uh, what we can take solace in. We're Canada's education city. Mm-hmm. University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and Conestoga College by far are firing on all cylinders. You look at Conestoga College, 1,000 students two years ago in Waterloo, now approaching 3,000 students, soon 4,000 students, opening up a new campus in the city of Kitchener. Um, we're all firing on all cylinders, so that's, uh, that's good. We're still Canada's education city, um, but uh, your, your concerns are right. Like, you know, what are you going to do with a five-bedroom place if uh, that becomes a popular? But that's the free market making its choice. Right? Do, you, do, you and, see, do you see permits slowing down or, or not being released if they build that sort of property? Um, not being released. I'm not sure we can do that. Um, but in terms of uh, requests slowing down, 
Uh, every time I think they are slowing down, next thing you know, another one comes through. We just had one last night where it came through where three, four, five houses on uh, Albert Street at Hickory are uh, being slated for a new development. and High rise. High, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody's everyone's going up. up. Like everybody's, you said, everyone's, everyone's going, going up. up. And <laughs> the reality is uh, the province dictated many years ago to say we need increased density. And uh, sprawling is, is not working. Mm-hmm. Sprawling just takes up more space. And every time we sprawl, that means there's more roads for us to plow. More, uh, what you don't know is that every time a new development goes into play, so like, say, Beechwood 50 years ago, those roads, those pipes are all paid for by the first-time residents and then gifted to you and I to look after forevermore, which is why, through property taxes, you and I now have to pave and redo all the pipes and all that throughout Waterloo. And people say, why is there this infrastructure deficit? That's why. We didn't pay for the pipes in the first place in the city. They were given to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we have to pay for them. There you go, part one with Dave Jaworski, Mayor, City of Waterloo. Don't forget to listen in for part two. We're going to talk a little bit more about Uptown Waterloo and the ongoing construction. Will it ever end? Uh, The Ontario government's plan to reduce their subsidy for youth sporting permits. How does he feel about what the the government's doing? Are we going to have more kids hanging around in the mall instead of in a gym getting active? Uh, Regional Council Review. What does he see happening? How's it going? And, of course, pot shops. He is a supporter. I saw him smile on video when he was talking about it one time. We're going to talk more about that coming to uh, a part of Waterloo near you. Don't forget to follow us on both Facebook and Twitter. RBC Stephen Green are the handles. And we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Green Effect Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Google Play so you catch the next episode. And don't forget to leave a review. Much appreciated.